Miracles, Part 9. We've been discussing Eric Metaxas' miracles, what they are, why they happen, and how they can change your life. And uh, we're getting towards the end. Um, we're going to discuss one more uh, medical miracle on nuts. Um, and then we're going to move into other kinds of miracles. Since the extraordinary experience related in the previous story, my friend Paul Teske, those of you who were here last week will may remember who Paul Teske is, um, had, has indeed been in, active in healing ministry. He travels the world telling the people his story, telling them Jesus can heal them today, and then praying for the healing of anyone willing to come forward. And uh, I'm summarizing uh, a couple paragraphs from his stories. Uh, Metaxas picked out one that deals with nut allergies. Paul was invited to speak to a group of about 300 business people at a conference in Dayton Beach, Florida in May 2012. When Paul finished talking and asked whether anyone in the audience needed prayer for healing, no hands went up. Then a middle-aged woman raised her hand and Paul called her forward. She did so rather reluctantly because she was a member of a Baptist church where the concept of healing in the church today was actively frowned upon. Uh, I know another church that kind of feels that way a lot of the time. Uh, Paul asked her what her name was and then asked her what she needed praying for. She told her, him that her name was Juanita and that she had a severe nut allergy which had plagued her from birth. He asked her to explain the severity of her allergy. She said it was so severe that whenever she flew, she had to be in what is quite seriously termed a nut-free zone. The woman explained that over the years she had been rushed to the emergency room numerous times due to inadvertent exposure to nuts. One of these visits had been nearly fatal. As he usually did, Paul silently prayed, asking God to tell him anything else that this woman needed praying for, needed prayer for, since people were often too shy to reveal certain things. Paul said that as he prayed, the words broken heart immediately came to him. So he quietly asked her, who broke your heart? My father, she replied, and burst into tears. Paul probed more deeply into the woman's relationship with her father and found that it was severely strained. He then walked her through a prayer to forgive her father and to release him to God. Then Paul prayed, asking God to heal her heart. Paul then asked God to allow the woman's nut allergy to be healed as evidence of the restoration of her healed relationship with her father. Juanita then informed Paul with a measured amount of concern that the only way she could be sure of being healed was to eat some nuts, which had until that point in her life obviously been very dangerous to do. After Paul s spoke a few, words more, uh, a few more words of affirmation, Juanita expressed her gratitude and left. The next morning, Paul got a call from the conference host who said that she had indeed met the woman at the breakfast and had spoken with her. The woman told her after the prayer service the night before she had decided to test the supposed healing. So she had deliberately sought out a candy bar containing nuts. On the desk near her bed, she had placed the syringe she carried uh, serum in case she started to go into anaphylactic shock. I would think it would be epinephrine, but whatever. Um, she, took, she then took off the, can the wrapper and slowly placed the candy bar into her mouth, praying as she did so. She bit off a chunk, chewed, and swallowed. Then she waited. For several minutes, there was no allergic reaction. She continued to wait. The allergic reaction never came. She said that's when she knew she had been healed. That evening, the conference ended with a banquet. The host invited one and to the mic, asking her to share what had happened with the audience, which she gladly did. She ended by saying she had learned two things. First, that there was no doubt that Jesus still heals today. That she was standing there after having eaten nuts was dramatic proof of that. And second, that she actually didn't like nuts. <laughs> and uh, moving on to the uh, <clears throat> second story, called, entitled A Beggar in Ghana. Central Presbyterian Church in Manhattan on 64th Street and Park Avenue is a gorgeous historic church from whose pulpit the controversial Harry Emerson Fostick once preached before fleeing northwest to the Chartres-inspired Riverside Cathedral created for him by John Rockefeller. 
Fosnick didn't believe in miracles. Uh, that's fascinating. John Rockefeller, of course, is Jewish, so um, I guess uh, in that particular brand of religion, they kind of fuse. Uh, on the morning of October 6, uh, 2013, Pastor Doug Webster preached a sermon that touched on a miracle he had been close to. Doug teaches at Beeson Divinity School, which is part of Sanford uh, University in Birmingham, Alabama, not to be confused with Stanford. Doug <coughs> has been involved in a ministry in Ghana, which he has vig visited regularly. That Sunday morning, Doug told the story of what had just happened among the people of this ministry that previous week in northern Ghana. It is headed up by an amazing man named David Mensa. And to, uh, what took place involved a man named Simon, who is the chief driver for the ministry. Simon has suffered with diabetes for years, and in August 2013, a sore had developed on his left foot. The foot was deteriorating badly. In fact, David was sure Simon would need to have the foot amputated. But he didn't have the heart to tell him that, knowing that for a driver to lose his left foot, his clutch foot, meant that he would also lose his livelihood. As the foot got worse, Simon finally went to a teaching hospital in the city of Tamale to get a professional opinion. The doctors corroborated what David had feared. The foot would have to be amputated, and soon. The next morning, he decided to go to a prayer service in the gazebo in the village of Tamale, where the staff of the ministry gathered each morning. The people at the service prayed for Simon's foot, although he felt nothing in particular when they prayed. Later that day, Simon was uh, filling his truck with gasoline at a fuel station. While he was pumping the gas, a man who looked to him like a beggar approached. But the man said he didn't want money. The man then told Simon that he had seen that he was limping and asked if he could pray for him. Simon assented, and the man took out a small vial of oil, anointed Simon's leg, and prayed for him. When Simon finished fueling his truck a, mom a few min moments later, he tried to find the man, but inexplicably, the man was nowhere to be found. But that, uh, things got, that day got stranger still. When Simon got home, for no reason he could discern, his foot suddenly felt warm. It seemed that something was happening. In the next few minutes, he saw what? He saw that in a matter of hours from that moment, his foot and leg were completely and miraculously healed. He said that he actually saw the coloration change with his own eyes. When Simon went back to the doctors and showed them the foot, they said that for all they knew, from all they knew, what had happened to his foot, a reversal of the worsening deterioration, was impossible. They said they felt that it was miraculous. Simon knows that it was miraculous. He believes that not only was the healing a miracle, but also that the beggar who prayed for him that day was in fact an angel in disguise. Uh, chapter 11, Miracles of Inner Healing. When someone is healed of a disease or injury in a way that seems miraculous, we cannot help but marvel. But there is still something to marvel about in all healing, even when it is slow and conventional. The idea that our bodies can heal themselves is in its way amazing, and to watch a wound heal over time is itself extraordinary, just as recovering from an illness is. You don't believe that? Try sewing a laceration up on a cadaver and see how it heals. Uh, <clears throat> If all good comes from God, then we may uh, acknowledge that he is behind all healing, whether it is of the miraculous vi variety or the slower, more typical kind. The same is true of what has been called inner healing. Anyone who has suffered grief knows that time usually heals the awful wound we feel when we first lose someone. Similarly, in many cases, our bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone who has hurt us may soften over time. The wound they inflict gets better and we are not as debilitated by it as we once were. Of course, you can irritate it and make it worse with time. <clears throat> of course, just as with a physical wound, we may be affected in a way that improves over time, but that never goes away entirely. We may have the equivalent of a scar or a limp that never goes away. Miracles of inner healing are instances when God seems to do in a few moments what would typically take years to heal, or which would perhaps never heal. Sometimes inner healings can be linked to physical healings, as in the case of Juanita in our previous chapter, whose forgiveness of her father seems to have been a necessary precursor to physical healing. You may remember the example of the uh, man uh, who was paralyzed, 
who was healed by letting him in through the roof. Um, <coughs> but here's the story that he, that, uh, he gives on forgiveness. April Hernandez and I became friends as co-hosts of the 100 Huntley Street, a nationally syndicated Sunday morning TV show. She and her husband, Jose, have been married eight years and have a young daughter. April, uh, to take a long story and make it short, she had an abortion early on. Uh, and it was a very emotional experience for her. Uh, and part of the wounds of the abortion, I'm just going to give you at the end here. After the abortion, as she sat in front of the building waiting for her ride to arrive, an old woman came over to her with a pamphlet that said abortion was a sin. April didn't dare make eye contact with her, but the woman persisted in making her take this pamphlet. April made it clear she wasn't interested, and the woman said, you're going to hell for what you've done. After a few years, April began going to church, but she under no circumstances was buying into the whole Jesus thing. She would go and sit in the back where she felt comfortable and safe. She had somehow ended up in a predominantly Dominican church, I'm assuming that's from the Dominican Republic, in the Bronx. Although she was a Latina who spoke some Spanish, her first language was still English, so she often didn't understand everything the pastor was preaching about. But one Sunday morning as she sat in her usual seat in the back, things felt different. She found herself understanding more of what the pastor was saying. Well, how did they do that? of what the pastor was saying it should be clearly and uh, uh, she noticed that a number of uh, times she said the Spanish word for forgiveness the word forgiveness spoken over and over began to have an effect on her and she suddenly dis felt a desperate desire to want to be closer to God April remembers that suddenly she was stretching her hands in the air almost as though she were falling and reaching out so that God could grab her hand the feeling was overwhelming April began to cry, and as she was crying, she heard the pastor say that if anyone in the congregation needed forgiveness, they should walk up to the front. He repeated this over and over, and he said that God was right there in the room. April absolutely didn't want to go up because she knew people would be looking at her, <coughs> Excuse me, and she didn't want anyone to see her. But at the same time, she was resisting. She felt another part of her pushing to go as though her life were at stake. Slowly, she began walking toward the front, weeping as she went. She could feel her heart beating, and she no longer, and she longed to return to her seat, to run out of the church, but she kept walking. If you need to be forgiven, the pastor said, God is here, and he loves you. When she got to the altar, she shut her eyes tightly and reached her hand out again, desperately wanting to be touched by God, and out of her mouth came the words, Father, Please forgive me for what I have done. Please forgive me, Father. I am so sorry. April says as she was, continued to sob, she was practically screaming out these words, Father, please forgive me. Suddenly she lost all sense of everything around her and she felt an immense heat or energy traveling throughout her body. The power of it was so overwhelming that her knees became weak and she fell to the ground in the fetal position. As she lay there weeping and feeling this heat moving through her body, she heard a voice very clearly. It spoke with profound peace in a kind of whisper, I forgive you, my daughter. Cry no more. She knew it was the voice of God. Then it said, but I need you to forgive yourself. April said that at the same time as, she's, as, as this, she could actually feel the energy healing her uterus as if it had been damaged in some way. I physically felt God move in my body, she said. It was being put together again, being made whole. During this entire experience, she was lying on the floor. It seemed as, though, it seemed as if she had left the realm of time, as though it were all taking an eternity. But later she realized it had only taken a few moments. April said that when it was over, some women in the church helped her up again. And when she rose, she said, it felt like a huge weight had been lifted off my soul, spirit, body, and mind. For the first time in her life, she had experienced God's unconditional love and forgiveness, and she would come to see that it wasn't a temporary fix. It had changed her forever. But the healing wasn't finished. 
That evening as she lay in bed next to Jose, Jose was speaking when suddenly it was as if she was, were being taken to another realm. She could hardly hear Jose's voice anymore. There was a kind of echo and she felt as though she were drifting. Her body became somehow numb and she stared at the ceiling and suddenly she had a vision. She said it began like a drawing from an etch-a-sketch. At first she saw a small figure and then as the vision became clearer and more detailed she could see that the figure was a little girl playing happily in a green field surrounded by daisies. April knew that the girl's name was in fact Daisy. The girl turned around and April now saw that she was about five years old, the age her daughter would be if she had brought her to term. April saw that the little girl looked a, a lot like she did. It was obvious the girl was in heaven full of joy and life. Then the girl spoke, it's okay, I'm okay, you need to let me go. Now, that's, uh, that's one of the kind of, if I can call it that, non-demonstrable non miracle stories. And one of the reasons why I'm gonna shorten a lot of these is because there's not really much there that's testable, although certainly if you've gone through the experience, you would feel very uh, uh, you would feel like for you it was uh, something that uh, you couldn't really deny. Seeing Jesus. I've been with friends, I've been friends with Eva Meyer since 1990 when we met through friends at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Darien, Connecticut. Eva grew up in Westport, Connecticut. Her father, the late C.J. Meyer, without a jot or tittle of doubt, the smallest, smartest person I've ever met. Just speaking with him required great powers of concentration. Was a physicist whose interest in finding a unified field theory was as serious and fascinating as he was. At the heart of the tumult of the family was Eva's older sister, who essentially gave over the care of her six children to Eva's parents and to Eva. Uh, there's an issue with substance abuse addictions Eva had all the responsibility of caring for the children and loving them, but none of the rights of a mother. Um, and the, the story goes on that uh, multiple, uh, multiple times the real mother would take her back, uh, the children back and then basically dump them on Eva and then take them back and dump them on Eva. The youngest of the six was Jonathan, 18 months old. Eva's heart was so scarred from the back and forth with these children that she was determined not to not let herself open her heart up to Jonathan. That night, Eva went to bed burning with anger at her sister. She had never experienced such anger and hate for anyone as she did that night for her sister. As Eva was rolling over in bed trying to silence the screaming fury in her brain, she glanced over out her bedroom window. It looked out over the driveway. The neighbor's bright garage lights always cast the silhouette of the trees between the two lots on her white curtain. But this time the silhouette looked different. It looked for all the world like the Shroud of Turin. Eva said that the image grew in size and seemed to come closer to her. And then she realized it was indeed Jesus she was looking at. As this image came yet closer, she pulled the covers over her eyes, hoping she was simply imagining it. But when then she pulled down the covers and peeked out, and there he was, even closer now, standing in the room between the window and her at the bottom left corner of her bed. Eva saw that his eyes were still burning like fire, and she felt that she could hardly breathe. She was consumed with fear, and now she began to become painfully aware of the rage and hatred inside of her. It was an unbearable feeling as it came to a head, and as it came to a head, she desperately found herself blurting out, have mercy on me, Jesus. And then she spoke the words that echoed what Isaiah famously spoke when he found himself in the presence of God. I'm a woman of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. She was surprised that it came out of her mouth, but it did. She was still seized with terror, and as those words came out of her mouth, she expected to feel God's wrath visited upon her. She knew that for the bitter hatred she was feeling, she deserved it. But the instant the words left her lips, she saw that the image was beginning to come close, clearer. It was Jesus, his face, his beard, his linen robe, his hand raised up over her in silent benediction. 
she saw him clearly now and even understood that he was praying over her. Suddenly all the fear melted away and she found herself bathed in his love and a warm, comfortable presence. She said that waves and waves of the safest, warmest love enveloped me. I felt like I did when I was a baby and my dad rocked me in his arms till I fell asleep. I kept whispering, oh, please, Jesus, stay with me. I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Those ellipses are in the original. Jesus stayed at the foot of her bed all night until after sunrise, and during this time, she soaked up every drop of his presence. During the whole time, his presence comforted her. But Eva said that no words can possibly do justice to what he imparted to her that night. But the words that come to mind for her are courage and strength and peace and joy and overwhelming love. The rage and hatred and the hate she had felt a few hours before had vanished. They seemed a distant memory. After dawn, Eva began to dr finally began to drift off to sleep, but then woke herself up just to make sure he was still there. He was. He was as real as I was, she said. It was about seven when she last glanced at him, still silently praying for her. She felt that she didn't want it to end, ever. He had somehow managed to untangle all the knots in my heart, she said, all the strangling, choking hatred and hurt and fear inside of me. Sometime shortly after seven, she must have fallen asleep because she was awakened just before eight by Jonathan crying in his crib in the next room. Immediately, Eva jumped out of bed and ran to him, seeing him standing in his crib, sobbing and confused, her heart broke like a dam. The love she now felt for him was surging, overwhelming. And uh, to finish the story, almost 10 years exactly from when this happened, Eva and her husband Paul were officially declared to be Jonathan's sole legal parents. God and marriage. Um, perhaps the first story I thought of when I considered writing this book was the story of my dear, very dear friends, Paul and Lisa. And I'm I'm not going to go through the whole thing. There's, uh, again, there are experiences people had, not anything that you can, that, uh, uh, that you can't really explain as coincidence and psychological influence and all that kind of stuff. Um, and just to summarize that they both had visions of Jesus at different times and eventually their marriage was saved, at least that's where the book ends. Um, and 12 angelic miracles and he has a little introduction for he shall give his angels charge over you Psalm 91 11 um, the Bible is filled with stories about angels but many of us have our, had our views of angels confused by popular misconceptions about them the principle of that of which is that angels do not actually exist any more than fairies do or wood nymphs or water sprites but they do exist, and the Bible attests to their existence innumerable times. Uh, my friend April Hernandez, whose story of inner healing appears in a previous chapter, told me just such a story. It happened when she was 13 years old. She had gone to the beach in the Bronx with some friends, but when they had decided to go into the water, far from other people, there was an immediate and very sharp drop-off. April couldn't swim, so she wasn't about to go in. Instead, she stood with her legs in the water, near the edge of this sharp drop-off, uh, drop intending to go no farther. But as she stood there, her friend, who herself wasn't much of a swimmer, began to tease April. Come on, she said, goading her not to be such a chicken. Then without warning, she grabbed April and pulled her into the deep water. April immediately went under and panicked. In a desperate desire to save her own life, she frantically grabbed at her friend and began pulling her down too. April knew she was drowning. Then suddenly she felt a powerful hand grab her by the arm and pull her the few feet to shore, saving her life. But when she opened her eyes and looked up to see who had saved her from drowning, she saw no one. It had to be an adult because it had a very strong grip and had pulled her right out. But there was no one there. On the sand around her, there were no footprints. Nor were there many people on the beach at all, and certainly not near her. Angels in Church. Uh, my friend Peter Martin. Peter was telling me that he had seen two magnificent angels at St. Thomas's Church on Fifth Avenue within the past year. And he proceeded to tell the stories with all of the brocaded and filigree decides one expects from Peter. And again, uh, it's a, a kind of a vi vision type of thing, which is really hard to confirm. My friend Eva Meyer was 13. She 
made some new friends, and one of them invited her to, uh, to a sleepover. Eva soon realized that these girls were rather different from the ones she had been used to spending time with. For one thing, they were all interested in the, in the occult. But Eva did not wish to break through to the uh, break on through to the other side. So the girls decided that they would take a walk to the beach instead. The quickest route there was a straight down Hillspont, Hills Point Road and over Hills Point Road Bridge, which crosses I-95. When the girls got to the bridge, Eva saw that there was a six-foot tall stockade fence blocking the road. Evidently, there was road work being done on the bridge, although they couldn't see past the tall fence to see exactly what was being done. But the girl whose house they were staying at told them she climbed the fence all the time and just walked across the bridge. She insisted that she had done it many times and explained that they just didn't want cars driving across it, but it was absolutely fine to walk across it. Eva explains that for some strange reason, they insisted that she go first. They would boost her up and help her get over the fence. To this day, Eva cannot figure out why she agreed to, to go first, but she did. She says that at the time, she was a five foot two, maybe 140 pounds, somewhat chubby, very weak 13-year-old girl who had never done a single pull-up in her life. Maybe this is why she agreed to the three of them helping her over first or why they suggested it. So the three girls boosted her up with their hands and essentially heaved her up and over the six-foot fence. It was in the next split second that Eva saw the trouble. To put it in her own words, precisely as she typed them to me, there was no bridge there. Nothing. It was an unspeakable horror, the sort of thing about which one has recurring nightmares. Neva, pardon me, Eva remembered in that briefest of moments seeing a huge semi-truck roaring right beneath her flailing legs, which were kicking in midair, and she remembers the feel of the rough top of the stockade fence, which she desperately tried to grasp as her body went over. Instinctively, she screamed, Jesus. Then, just as she lost her grip and began to plummet to what she knew would be her death on the highway down below, with the endless speeding trucks and cars, she felt herself lifted up. She saw nothing. But in the blink of an eye, she felt herself being scooped up in midair and carried back over the fence and placed on solid ground, but a full 10 feet away from where the three girls had tossed her over. She says that she remembers landing. My arms were stretched out wide as though a parachute had brought me to a soft landing. And then she remembers the unhinged looks on the faces of the other three girls. She remembers that they were utterly horrified, scared witless. Eva says they were white as sheets with mouth agape and eyes wide in terror. All three of them shrieked and instantly bolted the scene, running away as fast as they could. Twenty-something years later, around the time of her high school reunion, Eva discovered that the girl whose house they had been staying in was a full-fledged Satanist. You are not going to die. Elisa... Liberis is my chief of staff, uh, says Eric Metaxas. She was, to make a uh, long story shorter, uh, she was riding her bicycle when a Mack truck turned in front of her. I don't know if I thought I was going to collide with the truck or die or what, but I sat up and released my hold on the handlebars. Then something abruptly shocking happened, which she says is hard to describe exactly. She says the best way to put it is that she heard a voice, but not an audible voice. The voice was clear and forceful and emphatic, and it rebuked her, saying, you are not going to give up that easily. You are not going to die. As she heard these words, she felt as though an invisible pair of hands grabbed the handlebars, and on the first knot, the handlebars jerked to the right to get her out of the way of the truck. But then she was heading straight into the concrete island, and on the second knot, the handlebars jerked hard to the left, directing her through the thinnest of gaps, perhaps two or three feet wide, between the truck and the concrete island. She whizzed by the panic-stricken truck driver, and then she was out. The truck and the island and the pedestrian were all behind her, and she was continuing down Church Street without ever having braked or made contact. Cheng uh, train station is a story of uh, John Bechtel who got uh, on an important train in China, helped by an invisible to others lady, and then uh, who th who then disappeared. And 
other varieties of miracles. The dream that made me help uh, write Bonhoeffer, which is a dream. Uh, interesting story. Uh, not relevant for what we're talking about. Uh, the Lost Keys. This is a more interesting one f for w what we're talking about. Um, for example, I have a very dear friend named Kimberly Thornbury who once lost her keys. A very organized person, I might add. Um, but it wasn't an ordinary set of keys. It was basically the keys to the entire uh, institution. Um, she couldn't find them for three days. And finally, she and her nanny prayed. And as they looked up, that's when she saw them. The nanny saw them at exactly the same time. They were gingerly, indeed precariously, situated in the middle of the outside of the car's windshield. If Kimberly had been sitting in the driver's seat, they would have been immediately in her line of vision. She had just gotten out of the car, so they weren't there before. They sat on the sloped glass, so perfectly in the middle of the windshield that Kimberly simply reached out her hand and grabbed them off the glass from where she was standing. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that kind of thing? I guess technically it could be not a miracle. It had been sitting on the car and she braked and slided down and slid down. But um, Two Hemispheres, Three Songs, and this is a story of uh, my friend uh, Larry Crabb at a New Canaan Society event in San Francisco. And the story is of uh, Larry and his son. And the song's great is thy faithfulness. I love you, Lord, and it is well with my soul figured in what you call a timing coincidence where people halfway across the world experience the same thing at the same time. One phone call, and that's my friend Larry Poland. And this is a story of a timely phone call that prevents a suicide and produces instead a conversion. Call to Bogota, God gives Larry, uh, Larry Poland, a second chance to witness. Um, a girl and a squirrel, my close friend Rick and Barbara Vlaha, and God finds a home for a squirrel and makes the daughter of these people happy at the same time. Um, touching Eternity, uh, that's another, uh, another section, and uh, the first one is A Sobbing Judge, or Alice von Hildebrand. Uh, coincidences lead to dismissed charges, and Alice is meeting a longtime friend of her deceased husband. Um, USS Washington, June 1940, Alice von Hildebrand again. Uh, only this time earlier, where she escapes from being sunk by a German submarine. Um, beyond death, uh, Andrew DeVries keeps his leg and experiences heaven. Um, not technically a near death, well, maybe sort of near, near death, but not, not the conventional near death where you know the heart stops and the person floats off kind of thing. Uh, the Power of God. My friend Brad Stein has a private experience in public. That is, he had an experience where he thought something was happening and nobody else seemed to notice it. Um, on September 11, 2001, New York City, some of you may remember that date. Um, my friend uh, Lolita Jackson escapes from the South Tower. And uh, uh, How Miracles Can Change Your Life. There's a sh four paragraphs, and then there's an interesting passage for uh, those of us in this room, I think. There had once been no barrier between us and God and eternity. In the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve. There was no separation between him and his creation. But in the fall, however one interprets that story, the liberty we once had came to an abrupt end. And then... He connects it later with the story of Jesus. Um, interesting, what do you do with theology when your world has lots of time and it's difficult to, uh, uh, how do you fit Adam and Eve? Obviously, he fits Adam and Eve in there somehow. Anyway, now, my take on all this, there's a lot of things to comment on. Allergies could have psychological influences affect them. Um, 
And I, I guess I have to tell you the, the story that I had on nut allergies. Um, I'm an emergency physician, so whenever I go on a plane, I let the stewardess know that if they have an emergency, uh, that they should let me know and I'll see what I can do to help. And uh, they're usually quite thankful about that. Um, and a couple of times I've been actually asked to help with somebody uh, who had an emergency. One that I remember is a uh, diabetic. But uh, in this particular story that has some relevance to this, uh, um, I was sitting there eating uh, uh, peanuts and raisins, you know, gorp. Um, and uh, I, I had just let the stewardess know that I was that I was an emergency physician. Sat down and ate, ate something because I was hungry. And uh, uh, the stewardess brought somebody else in who was um, being assisted and it sounded like asking for assistance and then explained to the stewardess that she was extremely in, uh, allergic to nuts, particularly peanuts, and that if there were any on the plane anywhere that she would break out uh, and she could uh, you know, go into anaphylactic shock and so they needed to remove all the peanuts from the plane. Um, so I quietly put my nuts away in my bag because I didn't feel like um, telling her that, uh, that uh, by the way, you just walked into where peanuts are. And um, I just silently not saying anything. Uh, you know, if she went bad, I was going to be called. So... And of course, then it meant I had peanuts on my hands, which would make things worse. Uh, so I didn't say anything. Um, and um, they obligingly went through and removed all the peanuts from their snacks that they were going to give and uh, took them off the plane. And uh, um, the snacks are nowhere near as good as the peanuts normally are. But anyway, um, and I'm not saying word and then at the end of the flight she got off and walked off and I was tempted to say by the way uh, did you know what <laughs> what was behind you the whole time uh, but I thought uh, that might not be a good idea <laughs> so I didn't so she walked off the plane so I'm um, when I hear about people who can't have nuts I know that sometimes it's real and well sometimes it's the knowledge of nuts rather than the nuts themselves um, but uh, uh, so that's one of the healing miracles that I'm not quite as impressed with as some of the other ones although you know I will have to say that, that eating them probably does make more difference than uh, just sitting in front of them um, and they're, the healing of psychological scars I think could be ignored I mean the mind is very powerful and you accept that and don't ask too uh, too uh, loudly whether uh, uh, whether the mind itself is uh, in miraculous, um, and of course uh, uh, ignore the hard pro problem of consciousness. Consciousness, as they say, uh, timing miracles can be ignored. Although with enough of them, chance becomes an increasingly strained explanation. Our Lady with the keys that were parked, well, somehow they were balanced just right so that they slid just part way down the windshield when she stopped. Maybe. Um, especially after driving around for three days. That's pretty hard to do. Angel miracles tend to explain, strain the explanatory power of naturalism. A friend who's lifted up by whatever it was and placed back on the other side of a fence and uh, our friend who's grabbed and pulled out from being drowned and nobody's there, you know, those kinds of things. Um, they're, they're kind of up there with healing miracles. I've got to say that the diabetic foot would be pretty impressive, especially if you had before and after photos. It is probably fair to note that conversion does not prove doctrinal orthodoxy. And uh, I'm sure that some of you have noticed that there's 
at least not conventional Adventist doctrinal orthodoxy in some of these uh, miracles. Um, that's because although miracles can happen, and that's an important point, in fact, that's the point that we're making here, the major point, uh, miracles, number one, are not all from God, and number two, even more important, that the miracles that are from God can happen to people who don't have their theology completely straight. The disciples who were looking for an earthly kingdom went out and produced bona fide miracles. And I think miracles do point beyond nature, and I think that's the most important point uh, that we're dealing with right now. That's a relatively simple and minimalistic conclusion, but in this age, that's a profound conclusion. Uh, and that's why I've taken as much time as I have looking at miracles. Um, but uh, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, we have a couple of them in the back now. Go ahead. Uh, a few years ago when I was teaching a course in Canada, I had a group of students who one weekend decided to take a van and drive from Canadian Union College down to Banff and then do the circle that comes up several hundred miles and come back uh, to the college. And the next morning when they came to class, they were all very sober. And one of the men told the experience of what had happened. As you leave Banff, there's a very beautiful four-lane highway. And when you get beyond Lake Louise, it turns into a two-lane highway, but still a lot of traffic. One of the men said that he was kind of dozing, and all of a sudden he heard everybody in the van gasp. And just as he opened his eyes, he saw what was happening. There was a large bus coming towards them in the opposite direction, and straight in front of the van was a car with about three teenagers, and just as the, as the three vehicles were about to meet, the people in the car turned off into the ditch, and he, he woke up in time to see bus, van, car simultaneously passing each other on a two-lane road. So they were all very frightened by this and came back to the college, and the next morning he called his wife, and she said, well, how did it go yesterday? And he said, well, we had a, a good day, and he explained to her what had happened in the bus. And she said, that's very interesting. Because yesterday, and they had a three or four year old son. He got up in the morning and he said, mommy, I think we need to kneel down and pray that daddy will be safe. So she said, okay. So the two of them knelt down and prayed that daddy would be safe. About an hour later, the little boy came back and said, mommy, I think we need to kneel down and pray that daddy will be safe. And so the two of them knelt down and prayed that Daddy would be safe. And it happened a third time, and then the little boy was fine the rest of the day. And it apparently happened that the last time that they prayed was the time when the three vehicles nearly crashed into each other. And you can make of it what you will, but I can tell you it had a profound effect on that young father. Uh, that was something I was curious about, <clears throat> the idea of, of timing, kind of similar to that. Um, last month I was driving from Seattle uh, to Bella Coola, British Columbia, about 15 hours, and right at the very end of the trip, about 10.30 at night, I was just getting ready to drive down the Bella Coola Hill, which goes down about 5,000 feet in 10, 12 kilometers through 15 switchbacks on gravel, and uh, it was snow and ice. And to make a very short story short, I drove off the mountain at the top. 
and went whoosh, hit a tree down and uh, finally found my glasses in the back of the car and <clears throat> after about 10 minutes of looking and crawled out the window and up the bank to the top of the road and stood there for a while and was able to hitch a ride a couple hours down into town and when I got there I borrowed the phone of the guy who had driven me down and I called my mom and I said mom just calling to let you know that I I made it to, I made it home safe from uh, Patty's wedding and my mom said oh Dale it's so good to hear I just had a dream a couple hours back that I saw you drive your car off the top of the mountain and uh, you hadn't uh, told her yet about I hadn't that. told her yet I saw you crawl up uh, the bank and stand on the edge of the road thinking whether you should hitchhike into Bella Kula or back into Anochim and uh, I got up and I woke up and I prayed that somebody would come pick you up soon and uh, I was like oh what time was that and it was the same time as it happened you know and I and I think about that and of course this isn't the first time this has happened to my mom when I was <clears throat> about negative one month old uh, my dad fell a tree on his head and at the, sa at the same time as the tree hit him she knew that something was wrong and went and prayed for him until he regained consciousness, consciousness and was able to grab the chainsaw and cut the tree off of him and crawl to the pickup. And sometimes I wonder about these things. Are these miracles or are they just things that we don't know about uh, the, <laughs> the power of projecting our thoughts to each other? Um, now as a question, again, I live in a place where, um, for example, Sninik or Sasquatch, 90% of the population doesn't just suspect they know him to be it to be a real thing and many of my friends have had experiences having seen them even in groups uh, you know and again it suggests the power of the mind or the power of not all miracles come from God or um, yeah Oh yeah. And well, as I guess, far as the hand goes, I guess if we want um, experiences where people are aware of things at long distance, we should all move to Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was going to say my uh, uncle, who's a faller, also had an experience where he was grabbed by the back and uh, moved forward over several trees to avoid being crushed. My wife drove that road. Mm -hmm by accident, unaware at the time the road was starting until she started down it, she put the car in low gear and rode the brake all the way to the bottom. There are actually places along there where it, it's 18 degrees as, as you're going down. You know, instead of the normal six, it's really steep on that road. It's a fun road. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to piggyback on his question here. And my question is, for the big picture, you know, our salvation and eternity, our, what do we do with miracles when it happens to them? Are miracles like pivotal instances in our lives that it's not just for us? What do we do with them? What does God want us to do with them if it happens to us? What, where does it fit in this whole scheme of things that should, do they happen to us for a reason? And when they do, what do, what do we do with them? What does God expect us to do with them in order to fulfill his, his grand plans? I, I don't know. We can always answer that. But I think that storytelling and sharing is a very important part of the picture. When a miracle happens, somebody can learn something from it. And I can tell a story. I was probably about 10. My parents were missionaries in Uruguay. My father was in charge of the farm and the, the trucks and all of that. And he also taught English. And they had just um, dug a new well and we're putting, they laid a cement top on it, and they were putting in the pump. And we had a very, very bad rainstorm. 
And they were the, the boys that my father was working with were a little bit leery of what was happening because they could see light under the cement, through the, the, the cement uh, slab. They called my dad and he went, he said, and he looked and he saw the light too and he says, this thing's going to cave in, uh, let me save the pump. And so he ran back to the machine shop to get the wrenches to take the pump out. And as he walked, though, it was about six meters, eight meters, this slab turned upside down, and he was just near the edge of it. Now, the word went around school, and everybody knew about it in the morning. But uh, it was at noon, when my father came home for lunch, that my mom says to him, uh, how did the morning go? He says, uh, was amazing. And she said, I, I thought so, because I felt an urge to pray for you. Um, okay, so he told her the story, and then he says, well, and what time is it that you prayed for me? And she gave him the time, I was 9.30 or something, I don't remember the details, and he said, his face went pale. I saw it. And he said, that's exactly the time when I didn't make it back to the top of the well to remove the pump because I would have gone down in. Now, that miracle was shared and we all knew that it was not from the other side. It was from God. Now, we have to raise the uh, caution for ourselves as well. I think, and that is that the fact that we get miracles doesn't prove that we have everything straight. No, not at all. It's, it's easier to say when it's somebody else who's obviously got bad theology. <laughs> no, we'll come in behind you. Actually, I had an experience when I was pretty young. I, I think I was about 10. And uh, actually, I've told very few people this, but I guess that's changing. Um, I, uh, I had a dream, and uh, I remember waking up and thinking, that's strange, because I... You know how you see people in your dreams sometimes, faces. But I remember thinking, where does this face come from? I've never seen this person. But I remember they looked like kind of like similar to somebody I did know. But it wasn't the same person. And I remember telling my mother this. And, you know, she said something about, you know, well, dreams are, you know, there's all kinds of things with dreams. And just basically that was it. And then I, you know, went back to my life, I guess. But what had happened from the time I was 10, as at the time my parents were, uh, were, lived in the same house that I was born in. And I had two older brothers and a younger sister. And, uh, and everything was just a gone on as normal. And then within the couple of years, my parents at one point brought us all into the den and announced they were getting a divorce. And then shortly after that, my father moved out um, to the next city and got a little place there. And um, I mean, they, it, they asked me, do you want to go live with your father for a while? And I said, oh, okay, well, I figured nobody else did. So I, I thought, that's okay, I'll go do that. Um, and then, of course, as I did that, I went to a different school. It was, it was seventh grade. I started seventh grade. And I guess I was 12 then or whatever. And then my father is choosing the classes because they choose classes at seventh grade, you know, which I didn't know. But... Anyway, 
he encouraged me to take this class on improv improvisational drama. Well, um, oh, I forgot one thing. The, in the dream, there was, I saw the person's face, but also this other thing that I thought was strange, that there was this room and there were lots of people, you know, well, you know, several dozen people around the perimeter of the room. And then some people were in the center of the room and this was one of these people. And I thought, well, why did I particularly pick out this person's face or whatever, didn't make any sense. Anyway, so I went to this different school. I took this, my father encouraged me to take this improvisational drama class, which I probably wouldn't have taken otherwise. Anyway, so I, I was in the school for a month or two and I had made one friend at the time. And then this one day in class, as we used to, in this drama class, we would, everyone would stand around the edge of the room and then one couple people would do their little skit in the middle. And all of a sudden I got this flash and I realized that I had been here before. I saw all this and then I remembered that dream. And then everyone was in the exact same position that I remember in my dream. And the person, then I, I recognized the person. I didn't recognize him before, but I said, that, that was the face that I saw. It was similar to this friend, but it wasn't. And I hadn't thought of it before, and I hadn't remembered it until then. And uh, I always wonder why that happened, but I guess I, I, I couldn't deny that. And at the time, too, I should add that my, my parents had never spoke about religion at all. But within a year or two, I had come to another place that I, I got this feeling that I should decide whether to believe in God or not. And I really didn't relate those two things till today, but it may have had something to do with it. But I never understood. I, I realized there was some reason I, could, I was able to give that vision into the future and that the vision was so accurate that everyone was standing in the exact same position. So it was really kind of mind-boggling. Comment, uh, Jim. I think, too, when, when I think about miracles, I think that if, we, if we've experienced something in our lives that is not normal and, and, and it hints of the supernatural, for me it becomes an anchor point in life, all through life, that when life gets really complicated, you think back to that event that was God's way of drawing open the curtain a little bit and saying, I'm still here. And um, I was just married, Andrews University, about to graduate. We were dead broke. I helped the farmers, help the cows deliver calves at night. I was finding every bit of work I could find. But we were so broke, down to one meal a day and all this stuff. Well, I was going to graduate in three or four months, had a job, and we thought, wouldn't it be nice to go look for furniture? You know, we're not going to buy anything. We're just going to see, what is it like to look for furniture? And we went to Jawajak. I checked the gas gauge, you know, to see if we have enough. It was just hovering above empty, you know. Thanksgiving break, all my friends were gone. And we get out there, and we got carried away. And you go to one store, then you want to go to another store. Before we know it, we used up the gas to get back home. And, and it was brutally cold over there, just like it is somewhat, well, worse than here. But the wind was there. It was just horrible. And we couldn't get back to Andrews. Had a brand-new wife sitting in the car. And I remember getting out of the car and just, just I'm going to go for just walk to the, see if I can see a station or something. I didn't know what to do. No cell. I didn't have a cell phone at that time. No credit cards. It was just us and the wind. And I remember just walking about 30 or 40 feet and praying. And I said, God... I don't know what to do here. We can't get back home, and it's getting night, and it's getting really cold, and I was actually a little nervous about it all. And I remember I knelt down on one knee and had that simple little prayer and got up and started walking, and by then all the bushes had the leaves stripped away, but there was one little clump in a, in a little bush, and I was just, it just caught my eye, and I just looked over it again and looked at it again, and I walked over there, and it was a dollar bill clumped up in that bush. And I, I've got Back a then, that was five gallons. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And I, you know, I have a science background a little bit, and I, I was doing the probability thing. 
how could this possibly happen outside of some supernatural in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness? And I remember going back to the car, and I said, here's the money. And we had torn the car apart looking for quarters and nickels and dimes already. She said, where did you get that? And I said, it was stuck in the bush. And to this day, that was like 30 or 40 years ago, to this day, when life gets complicated, I think back to that thing that this is probably a miracle (laughs) as far as I'm concerned. So to me, that's the importance of all of this. God's opening the window at some point. I think you're right. I think that, that God does that in order to kind of reveal himself and to give us confidence. Uh, and you know you can write it off if you really want to but if it happens often enough you say nah and sometimes it's weird enough that just happening once is enough to kind of give you that confidence you know it's kind of funny because that's an experiential anchor that, that you can hold on to. Uh, for me, the anchor that, that for a long time uh, held me the, the strongest was, was not really that kind of thing. It was really more evidence of another miracle entirely, which is one that's kind of open to everybody, and that is um, when I was a senior in college, uh, I was taking a double major in theology and chemistry, and I needed to do a uh, seminar for chemistry. So that why not pick one that's kind of related to theology, and particularly went in and looked at the origin of life. And, uh, you know, the textbooks kind of encouraged, uh, well, we're getting close to getting this figured out. And the... Um, and, and the public perception is even stronger that way, uh, which you found out, what I found out, at least, when I went back to the original literature and read it, is that they were nowhere near what, what the popular conception was. That it was just a maze of difficulties. Uh, you know, you figure out the, well, I'll give you the whole seminar now, but <laughs> basically, Basically, it's difficult enough to form the very uh, uh, the building blocks that are necessary, and then you have to combine them, and you have to combine them in the right way. And uh, RNA makes the best way of combining things, but it makes it's the worst set of building blocks to use because they're complicated building blocks that need phosphate and a sugar and a nitrogenous base, and you can't make them all three in the same place. So what you have to have is a you know, lightning charge over here, and then a nice quiet pool with uh, alkaline stuff over here, and then they flow together. I mean, the more you think about it, the, the crazier it gets. Um, and, and then you have to combine them in the right way. And uh, I mean, those of you who have been here long enough know that Eugene Coonan has kind of uh, kiss that one goodbye unless you have a multiverse. Um, which means basically that you either believe that everything possible that's not physically impossible has happened somewhere and because we're not physically impossible that, they, that we're here or else you believe that there's a God who designed it all. And you know the hypothesis, the hypothesis of a God is always easier. And, and you know that for me Several things happened to me. One of them is you can't believe the popular accounts, especially if they're dealing with a theologically charged subject because they've got a dog in the hunt and they protect that dog. Uh, Number two, uh, uh, actually number one in terms of conclusions, and it was the one I never, from then that day on, I never worried about God, period. I might worry about what kind of a God he was, whether he's you know, more favorable to Adventists or Baptists or Presbyterians or Mormons or who knows what. You know. uh, I might worry about uh, you know, whether he was a God worthy of worship or something like that. But that there is a God is just something that I never really worried about since then. 
Now, that's not really a miraculous experience, but it fulfills some of the same things, I think, that you're talking about. Moses threw down his staff, and it turned into a snake. The magicians threw down theirs, and they turned into snakes. Moses' snake ate the other snakes. God can do a miracle. The devil can try to do one just like it, to deceive. And apparently, from outward appearances, can make it work. There's got to be a determinative factor beyond miracles that lead you to safety. I'm worried when it says even the elect can be deceived. There's something that's got to protect us from that deception. I think it's biblical truth. Uh, well, I think that the first step towards doing that is to accept that there is a real God and that there is a real devil. And right now in the scientific aspects of our society, those are, um, to put it mildly, disputable premises. A comment back here. No, I, I think in some respect we have to treat miracles in the same way we treat prophets in that, uh, you know, we are taught, you know, by their fruits you will know them. Uh, looking into Adventist history, we know that not one of our beliefs was ever originated by Ellen White. Uh, rather, her visions tended to confirm what people had been led through, led to through studying up to that point. Um, and when I look at a miracle happen and somebody tries to then, you know, I've uh, actually had this where a person had a miracle happen to them and then they uh, were traveling around and they stopped at the local Pentecostal church and were talking about how because they'd had this miracle, we all should believe such and such. Uh, and using their miracle as a justification for the establishment of their authority as a voice. And, you know, in other words, Miracles are the same as prophets, are the same as anything else. They still have to be tested. They still don't change the way that God works. You know, no miraculous sign would allow God to come and say, and now that I've shown you this miracle, it's good for you to kill your children. Um, yeah. And, and I think, in a way, that, that the experience of Abraham with, and Isaac, that was the point, is that God doesn't require your firstborn. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in other religions of the day, uh, that did happen. Uh, the king of Moab is reported to have sacrificed his firstborn upon the wall during a siege. And uh, the battle went his way. So I guess that proves that we should all be worshiping Moloch. Uh, uh, but, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an even finer point to it, and it's one of the things I was trying to allude to, is that, is that even people whom God is using and it's God that's performing the miracle don't always understand exactly what's going on. You know, I gave you the example of the, the apostles who are sent forth, the disciples are sent forth, and they're given power over evil spirits, and they're given power to heal. And presumably they had miracles of the same general order as those of Jesus. You know, and they come back, they're rejoicing. And Jesus said, well, don't get so excited about that. The real, the real thing is that your name is written in heaven. But these are disciples who are arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom as if it's going to be an earthly kingdom where you know, you can be the minister of finance and you can be the prime minister and you can be the, you know, below the king. And, and, uh, and James and John are saying, you know, um, maybe we can get our, our mother, who, as far as we know, was a cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And uh, so, you know, we got a little in here. Uh, and let's ask, can we have one on the right side and one on the left? And, and, uh, you know, Jesus said, you got this all wrong. You don't, you don't have any clue as to what you're asking for. And, um, and this is 
you know, these are people who have distinctly wrong conceptions of what the Messiah is supposed to do. And yet, they're performing miracles. So that means that, you know, some of the people here, I'm sure have, well, I mean, they're from different churches. Sometimes that doesn't matter too much, but sometimes it does. You know, there's some of them who I'm sure were taught to pray to the Virgin Mary. There's, interestingly, all of the ones that he records, none of them are, are, are praying to the Virgin Mary. Did you notice that? There are Catholics in that group. Um, uh, is that because uh, Metaxas is being selective? Probably so. I, at least I imagine that there are Catholics who can tell you that they prayed to St. Christopher or whatever and got what they wanted. Um, the ones that are being presented anyway are kind of Jesus-centric. And I think, I think that Metaxas has something to do with that because I think that uh, he is kind of a, uh, as you put it, a mere Christian, which means that Catholic, Protestant, whatever the, the, the main core is, that Jesus is your Savior, which... As far as that goes, if you're asking about Christianity, I'm that kind of mere Christian, too. I believe that Jesus is the core of things. And I believe that what Adventist doctrines happen to be important have to have Jesus as the center of their core, too. I think if we present them in any other way, we're doing people a disservice. Uh, comment back here. You may remember some years back we got into a casting out of demons excitement and there were Adventist ministers who were becoming known for their ability to cast out demons. And as the story goes, and I can't verify it, one of these men was in an evangelistic meeting and had diarrhea. So he was in the bathroom, not remembering that his mic was on, shouting, for the demons of diarrhea to go. And the brethren released, <laughs> released him rather than... <laughs> but, but casting out of demons is a, is a miracle and, and these fellows were becoming quite proficient at it, at least in their minds. And of course the name of Jesus yes. is an amulet to yeah. use for that kind of business. And and there's a certain responsibility. I, I'm going to give you an example of, of um, this friend of mine who every once in a while likes to tell about, or used to like to tell, and he, he's kind of gotten quieter to the point where uh, he's almost embarrassed to tell it now. Uh, well, he, he really wasn't that enthusiastic about it before, but he would kind of tolerate it, I guess, um, about how the how he was anointed and prayed over and his cancer just melted away. Uh, he's a physician. Turns out he had an antibody that was attacking the cancer. Now is that God? Was that the antibody? Is that God through the antibody? Uh, is that God working around the antibody? I don't know. He doesn't know. But one of the reasons why he's uncomfortable with the whole story is because the only other person he's ever known to have uh, survived an anointing, shall we say, was a fellow uh, in Thailand who was anointed because of some disease that was, you know, and we're told in the Bible to do that. So, I mean, it's not like uh, this is particularly anti uh, uh, biblical, but uh, the guy was healed. Three months later, he left his wife and lived a, a life that is difficult to characterize as Christ-centered. And of course, you know, now the guy is going, uh, why does God pick him and not somebody else when he's not going to live through it? Or he's not going to live righteously through it, I should say. So. 
it seems to me that's one of the most difficult elements of this whole question. When we were in Ethiopia, there was a, a Filipino missionary, a nurse, male nurse. He had his wife was also a nurse. They had four children. And he was murdered on the roadside, oh, perhaps 10 miles from the college where he was working. And it springs my mind back to when you were talking about the uh, disciples and so on. I mean, why is one stoned to death at the very beginning? Why is one put in cooking oil and it doesn't harm him? In other words, life as it is, is totally mysterious to us. And anyone who thinks they can answer all these questions is a fool. In other words, our own lives are confusing enough. But if we take into it just the biblical record, we are totally confused. We cannot know. And if you take it into the modern record as well, we're <coughs> hopeless. Yeah. The only thing I would say from my own personal experience is that when one is a child, the Lord is very merciful to a child. I remember I was about nine years old, and I was always losing my comb. <clears throat> but this is when we were in Africa, and there were huge, um, sort of one-foot-long grass fields all around the hospital. And I lost my comb, which I'd paid three shillings and sixpence for when a normal comb would cost about five pence. And my parents had sort of said, it wasn't a very wise purchase, was it? So I lost my comb. And so I go to the edge of the field, and I say, how am I going to find this here? So I closed my eyes, and I prayed. And I walked, and I walked, and I walked, until finally I felt I ought to open my eyes. And the comb was right in front of my shoes. Now, the Lord has never answered my question like that since I grew to be an adult. But when I was a child, I needed it to, to be, convince myself that the Lord really is there and that he loves me. And so you can have hundreds of stories. And when we were in Ethiopia, there was in two weeks four occasions when I should have been slaughtered by the people. You know, I killed a man on the road with the vehicle, etc., etc. But I walked out of those episodes, whereas Art Grosby, who was much uh, deeper and more effective a missionary than me, loses his life and leaves four children without a father. It was, we can't answer those questions. I mean, perhaps a thousand years will give us a chance to, to study it. Yeah, since the mic is so close by, I thought I'd share as well something which I consider the most insignificant miracle I've ever heard of, and the only one that I've personally experienced. Um, and that was when I was canvassing in my youth with a friend, and um, we were staying at a camping, camping site, just cycling to where we needed to go. And one morning as I was out, I looked at my hand to see what, you know, my arm to see what time it was. And I realized that my watch wasn't there. And so I took my other hand and rubbed the arm down like this. And I thought, I'm being crazy. I can see that it's not there, you know, why do I need to try this? And so I thought, well, I've got two options. Either I can cycle back there, which would take a considerable amount of time, or I can just, you know, hope that it will be there in the camping site bathroom when I get back. And then decided that I'd pray about it, that God would take care of it, and I'd just go on with the day. And so I did. And um, after a few hours, I kind of automatically looked at my arm, and the watch was there. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, this is crazy. I didn't pray for any, you know, miracle for God to put the watch back on my arm. And I've been wondering about this um, kind of ever since that, you know, that why did that happen? That was it that God just wanted to um, show that, you know, he will take care of our problems if we just do what he wants us to do, which is, and you know, in this case, I thought that, well, perhaps because I was able to spend more time out in the field, that maybe there was someone that really needed the message that I was kind of going out with through literature that wouldn't have been present there if I had gone back. Or maybe God just wanted to, um, you know, remind us that we can pray about every little thing, every little problem that we have, and he will hear these prayers and answers it in the way that he seems fit. Yeah, I was just thing. saying, if any of you are not been canvassing, then you've missed all the wonderful answers to prayer. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, going canvassing is just you have a flat on your bicycle and you have to walk 76 kilometers back. At that point, that tests your life. So if you haven't gone canvassing, go and try it. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, one more and I think we'll uh, close it yeah. for today. All right. You know, a lot of the stories we've talked about today have um, the question of what is God's will? 
and uh, what is, you know, all, all the miracles, many of the miracles we talk about have the element of freedom of choice. And when I think about miracles and the question of natural versus supernatural, it seems to be more a question of, of dealing with free will agencies versus non. If I see, if I'm walking down the road and an angel comes towards me, looks at me, knocks a tree over, and then disappears, there's no test that I can ever make to test if that angel is real based on putting trees in the way and hoping that one appears to knock it over. You, you can't test, you know, you can't test it. And, and so it, that, does that mean it's not natural? It just means it's, you know, does it mean it's not real? It just means it's beyond the realms of testability, you know, and when I think about all the miracles that I've heard about or have been involved in my family, it's, uh, it, it doesn't lead me to a belief in the existence of the supernatural. It leads me to a relationship with it. Um, maybe that's because a realization that the supernatural we talk about is not a thing. It's something that we are in relationship with. It's a, a will. And with, with that, I'll probably, uh, I'll just say, I think I agree with you on that. Miracles are not intended to convince us of the supernatural so much as they are intended to invite us to a relationship with one. I just had it real quick. Um, I, I like the comment over here that he was saying that, uh, you know, God kind of makes himself known. Well, I, I, I think of that scripture where um, it's, something like uh, be still and know that I'm God or something like that but it kind of God lets himself know know that he's there you know and uh, in a powerful way but it, it still takes faith you know mm -hmm. and that's what in that scripture just know that he's God yeah